If you're somebody that's holding SoFi stock or thinking about holding the stock, then this is definitely a presentation that you're going to want to watch. Fair disclosure, we're not long the stock. We never short stocks. That's a fool's errand. So we wrote this simply based on the demand from our readers. The title here says a ticking time bomb, and we're going to explain why we think that might be the case. Now, when you look at SoFi's mission, what they stated in their SPAC when they went public, it's a noble one. It's to help our members achieve financial independence to realize their ambitions. That acronym, H-E-N-W-S, stands for High Earner Not Well Served. And there's another acronym similar to that SoFi mentions. It's Henry. That's High Earner Not Rich Yet. And those individuals are probably not rich yet because they don't live below their means. Below, you can see the definition of the target customer for SoFi. So millennials born between 80 and 2000 who make between 100,000 and 200,000 per year or families making between 250,000 to $500,000 per year. So the potential addressable market they describe as being $2 trillion and that they're going to serve all these underserved individuals and retail investors really picked up on that messaging. So one of the problems for SoFi is that they became a meme stock and you can argue whether or not they are a meme stock. A quick look over at Reddit will provide enough evidence to make you believe that they are. The problem with that is it creates a lot of noise. So you can see here, we've highlighted this article from Bloomberg recently that talks about how this gentleman, we refer to him as Samir Nain in a jar, that gentleman from um, Office Space, only because we can't pronounce this name. And it's a bit of a joke because this guy has been walking around talking to every media organization that he can touting the merits of SPACs and saying how they're democratizing access to wealth for retail investors. Well, how did that work out for you there? It didn't work out at all. And we've been warning ever since he uh, invented the SPAC, he's often referred to as the father of SPACs, that that vehicle did retail investors no favors. And we can see that. Now, the meme stock party may be coming to an end. And this bottom article here correctly asks the question, you know, what meme stocks will survive the Reddit investor exodus? In other words, there are quality companies that get turned into meme stocks and there's some underlying value there once all the dust settles. And that's what we wanted to look at with SoFi was to say, is there value to be had in this meme stock? And unfortunately, we believe that there isn't. And the biggest reason for that is it's an extremely opaque operation. So pull up their latest 10Q as we did and start going through it. What you're gonna find is an entity that's so complex that even somebody with several advanced degrees in finance would probably need an entire semester and turn this into a project and a team of MBAs to properly model the risk if they even could of this extremely sophisticated operation. So things like, first of all, it's a $5.5 billion firm that has $6.9 billion in derivative contracts. That's notional value. That's the contracts that they're, um, they have to cover the uh, products that they're covering. And the majority of that would be $4.9 billion in interest rate swaps. So the problem you run into when you start engaging in large derivative contracts by notional value is that you're now subject to a lot of counterparty risk, which means that the firm taking the other side of that bet, whether or not they can pay remains to be seen if a black swan event happens. So a lot of these risk modeling algorithms don't properly take into effect the tail risk that can take place if the Ruskies suddenly decide to drop a nuke on Ukraine. So there's counterparty risk that SoFi is subject to and a great deal of it. And one of the things they're doing is they're packaging student loans and securitizing them. And we can remember what happened the last time that financial companies started to securitize loans and sell them. And that was the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. And one of the problems that you saw there were all the complex parts that made up what eventually blew up. So when we look at uh, SoFi, in terms of the stakeholders they have, there are a lot of parties that can create problems. First of all, you have the consumers. These are the people that SoFi lends money to. 
the American consumer. Take a look at Upstart. So our last piece, and I'll put that in the description of this video on Upstart, correctly pointed out the fragility of having all your eggs in the American consumer basket. And it showed the impact of what happened when the Rona hit. So people stopped taking loans and the demand dried up. So that really cripples your business. And since we wrote that piece warning on Upstart, which also appeared to be a meme stock, it's dropped 82%. And that's where it should be because that's a very risky business they're involved in. So you know, some of the other stakeholders here, institutional buyers, those are the firms that buy the loan bundles from SoFi. So if they suddenly stop demanding that those securitized products, then what happens? Then you have institutional lenders that are loaning money to SoFi, and then SoFi turns and lends it to consumers. So there's some complexity there. You have counterparties taking the other side of their $4.9 billion worth of interest rate swaps. And that risk is managed by vetting the counterparties that you do business with. And we're left with SoFi's assurance that they've properly vetted those counterparties. You have government. This is a problem. So if the government decides to start forgiving student loans, that has a direct impact on SoFi. We'll talk about that in a second. And then you have the Reddit meme stonk types that go around cheerleading the stock. They'll likely be by posting comments on this video that add no value and they do nothing but create noise, but they also generate a lot of awareness around firms like this, which is why we're covering it. Now, one of the things that we don't like about SoFi, it's the same criticism we have about Robinhood where they talk about democratizing access to wealth and then they sell their members who have $240 account balances, this is Robinhood, they sell them cryptocurrencies and extremely risky options. That's not how you build wealth. I mean, you look at these two statements, on the top is a statement that came from their 10Q, um, SoFi's 10Q. It says, should there be further student loan relief measures, that would likely have an adverse impact on our results of operations and overall business. That's easy to understand, right? So SoFi extends student loans, private student loans, and then once students avail themselves of those private student loans, they're no longer um, able to take advantage of any sort of forgiveness. So why would you ever do that? Why would you take that risk? Now, this second bullet point refers to a blog post that their CEO put out and put his name to at any rate, and it's asking for the Biden administration to end the confusion by giving distressed and defaulted borrowers the permanent relief they need, including student loan forgiveness. These seem to be very contradicting statements, and we won't get into the whole topic about why people that pay taxes should be subsidizing individuals who thought majoring in underwater basket weaving was a good idea. But the point is that there's regulatory risk surrounding what the Biden administration plans to do and how that impacts SoFi. It's just yet another risk. Now, here's a very interesting table to look at. And if you're an investor and you believe the bull thesis, here's some things that you really need to pay attention to. So. These are loan originations in terms of volume from last year to this year in the most recent quarter. Look at this. So you have home loans. There's three types of loans that SoFi is involved in, home loans, personal loans, and student loans. Look at home loans. So those dropped by 58%. So that's not working out too well for them. Student loans dropped by 2%. So that demand or the origination, demand for originations is, is is drying up, it appears. Personal loans up 151%. The average personal loan up from $21,000 to $23,000 with a weighted, average weighted interest rate of 11.02%, up from 10.85% last year. Is this how you help your members achieve financial independence by extending them personal loans? And how many of the people taking these personal loans are going to go use them to punt on cryptocurrencies or doing something stupid because they thought they're Gordon Gecko the last time they did some trading it was successful and now everything's crumbling around them so we don't think it's a good idea to be extending unsecured personal loans to young americans and we also think that with any sort of black swan event that might happen the likelihood of these being repaid is going to drop dramatically. And that's especially true if the quality of individual that you're loaning the money to declines. And we'll talk about that in a second, but we wanted to point to how originations for upstart 
plummeted when there was a crisis. So when coronavirus hit, look at how those loan originations dropped and revenues for Upstart were just plummeted. Now, they did resume their climb after that, but just goes to show that inflation, you know, two thirds of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Inflation is going to start making the ability to pay bills a lot more tougher, and that's going to reduce in, or that's going to result in um, a lot of loans not getting repaid, which is going to impact SoFi. Now, the unspoken truth that they don't seem to be telling people is that hardworking people get rich over time if they spend less than they make. People who live paycheck to paycheck are not doing that. People who take personal loans are not doing that because wealthy people don't pay someone else's interest. So the stated goal up front by SoFi is a lot different from the actions that we see them taking. So rich people of tomorrow preserve their capital and they don't use it to speculate on things like cryptocurrency. So over at SoFi now, you can trade, trade crypto. They don't even use the word invest, it's trade crypto. You can get up to $100 in Bitcoin and they have 30 available coins that you can speculate on. So that's probably not going to help their members achieve financial independence. And that's not really something we want anything to do with. Now, when we look at the sort of loan quality, so these are average FICO scores for the various types of loans being extended by SoFi. Home loans, you can see FICO scores dropping from last year to this year by 11 points. Student loans, roughly around the same. And look at personal loans, look at that drop in FICO score, what happens there? Well, if you're gonna continue growing, sometimes there's a real temptation, let's say not sometimes, there's always a real temptation to start laxing your constraints. We saw this happen in the 2007, 2008 crisis. Just lax your constraints so you can originate more loans, you can keep that revenue growth going and you start to sacrifice quality. So if you are somebody who's invested in SoFi, Pay attention to this. So dig into that 10Q. Sure, it's intimidating. It's extremely difficult to navigate. Even if you spent a great deal of your life working in, in that industry, it's still difficult to understand. So take the time to pay attention to metrics such as the decline in FICO scores or what we looked at earlier, where the originations are coming from. So all the growth for SoFi from last year to this year around loans comes from extending unsecured personal loans at a 11% interest rate. So that's certainly something that needs to be considered. To conclude, this business is far too complex and opaque to understand. So you shouldn't invest in anything that you don't understand. And if we had a good several weeks and we were able to work on this full time, I imagine we could put out a presentation that completely modeled it with a lot of assumptions being made and a lot of missing data points, but we could probably start to model the risk if we put that much effort into it. The biggest issue that we have with SoFi, there's just too much external risk that can't be controlled by the firm. They can't do anything about that. So in short, we wouldn't touch this stock with a 10 foot pole, regardless of how many bull stories. Yes, we know about the banking license. We've heard all the bull thesis arguments, but we wouldn't touch this stock with a 10 foot pole. So please put your comments in the comments section. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video today.